Greetings adventures and welcome to ADV in Japan. So I've finished up all the maintenance, everything that I wanted to do to the bike to get it ready and prepared for this trip uh, to Hokkaido. And I'm gonna go over some of these upgrades and downgrades that I've done. So one of the things I did is I removed the uh, lid filter that I had on here. I don't want that engine honk on me. I'll be driving, you know, about 1200, 1300 miles and I'm just not wanting to deal with that massive engine honk. So I ended up uh, replacing that with the stock lid. So essentially right now the filtration system that I'm using is the uh, the snorkel with a pre-filter on it and then I've got the stock filter inside there. That should be good to go for what I'm doing. I will lose a little bit of power but I'm not too concerned as the off-road that I'm going to be doing there is for the most part just flat forest roads with some incline. All right so having changed out my filtration system I figured I'd probably have to do something with the Fuel Light X and through that process through emailing the guys over at Protronic uh, I was able to clear up quite a few things uh, perhaps some myths out there that I have read and seen out on the interwebs and I'm going to go ahead and clear those up right now. So the Fuel Light X um, there's a myth out there that says when you first install this that you need to w once you connect it in and you know create that that loop between the oxygen center and the ecu that you need to turn the bike on and just the power you don't actually start the engine and you let it sit and then once these lights turn green then you're good to go you can turn the bike on and you're good to go and that if you don't do that that your calibration will be screwed up the entire time that the fuel x will never ever correctly interpret that air fuel mixture. That is a myth. I emailed the guys at Protronic. They said that is completely unnecessary step. Read the manual. There's nothing in there that says anything about that. So you don't have to do that. There is no, the only calibration that occurs is when the bike is in the idle. So you actually physically need to turn the bike on and let it sit in idle for two minutes when you first install. Now, the other thing he mentioned is if you do change anything with your exhaust, you make any changes to your filtration system, you need to do the same thing again. You need to turn the bike on in idle, idle the engine for two minutes, and the Fuel X will get used to whatever changes that you've made, and you're good to go. Another myth, the red and green lights. A lot of people out there are saying the red lights are bad, the green lights are good, it has nothing to do with any of that. According to Deepak, their uh, top mechanic over there, he basically said the blinking of the red LED light indicates that the map on the Fuel X is being activated. The red light starts blinking after the key and the kill switch are on. The blinking of the green LEDs during the idling of the engine indicates that the Fuel X is working in sync with the OEM ECU. So the red light doesn't necessarily mean that this is bad. It just means that uh, the Fuel X is being activated. It's starting up. It's starting to go. Um, so just a couple myths uh, broken up there. So that's exactly what I did. As soon as I made these changes, I went ahead and just turned the bike on and idle for two minutes and let it sit. The next downgrade, I don't know if you can call it a downgrade, but uh, is I went ahead and put on the rubber um, padding on my foot pegs here as probably 70, maybe 60 to 70, 75% of my my riding on in Hokkaido are going to be on road so I just want to be as comfortable as possible these are easily uh, pulled off with these uh, little uh, bolts down here in the bottom so if I feel the need to do that when I get off road I can certainly get that done real quick so the uh, the next um, downgrade I did was I put on the 15 tooth uh, front sprocket again I took off the 14 and that's just because as you can see um, the 14 tooth sprocket from JT Sprocket does not have a rubber dampener on it and uh, that makes for a pretty rackety ride as well and again like I said in Hokkaido I'm going to be doing about 70-75% on road so I want comfort I'm going to be on that bike for a long time so I went ahead and threw on this front sprocket if you want to know how to put this thing on and off it's very simple you can go ahead and check out the link above and figure out how to do that. If anybody knows of a front sprocket 14 tooth that does have a rubber dampener in it, uh, please let me know because I've been looking one, looking for one and I, I can't seem to find it. 
that's pretty much it as far as kind of returning the bike back to stock. So some of the upgrades that I did to the bike uh, to get it ready, I don't know if you noticed, but I have auxiliary lights now. So I picked these up here in Japan at a local store. Uh, I don't remember the name, the brand name. I'll have to look it up and I'll put it in the description for you guys. Uh, they're super cheap lights. They're about 1800 lumens for one light um at max brightness now the switch i have on my bike is only a, uh, a one stage switch these are two stage lights but unfortunately the, the switch that they sold at the store the only one they had was a one stage single stage so it just turns on max brightness it does a pretty good job um as you can see in the video here adds quite a bit uh in terms of um width like the breadth it just spreads that light out i can see much further to my left and to my right and a little bit better in front of me too as well. I felt like um, I needed something extra, especially with this little grill up front to protect my headlight. It does reduce the brightness a little bit. Uh, it just kind of refracts the light and doesn't make it, make it as strong. So I felt the need to get this. Now, this is a DIY uh, light rack. I just went to the store, got some hardened steel and it, it was perfect size, literally the perfect size. So I just went through uh, and did some, you know, some bending, bent these so that they would fit. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see under here, but basically I've, uh, I've bolted it to each side here. This thing is not going anywhere. It's very, very tight in there, cheap. I think this piece right here cost me like $3. So that's probably one of the bigger upgrades I did to get this bike ready to go. So one other upgrade I did too is uh, to purchase the Enduristan uh, holster, kind of uh, bottle holster. This attaches very nicely to their Blizzard uh, bags. And uh, I went ahead and pick up, picked up this, uh, it's, it's roughly 800 uh, milliliters, I believe, just about a liter little fuel bottle that they have. This is great. This is, I really recommend this holster. It's, it just really keeps everything locked in there very nice and tight. Uh, you know, you've got this, this strap up here that keeps everything locked in. And again, it just integrates very nicely into the Blizzard bag as well too. So again, just giving me another peace of mind. Uh, the other thing I did too, is I put on a tire pressure sensor system as well. These are really cheap on the fly. You can get them from Amazon. I think everybody, just about everybody has one of these. Just gives you that peace of mind. I'm not sure if I showed this to you guys, but uh, I also installed a voltimeter slash um, kind of power device too as well. Kind of tells you the voltage there. But I also have uh, two 3.0 quick charge uh, USB A, I believe. And then I got one USB-C PD, which I think is 30 volts. This sucker charges super, super fast. So uh, I mentioned it in my camera video. If you guys want to check that out, hit the link up above. But I also installed tethers at all of my mounting points where the camera uh, is not readily accessible by me. So you can see these, these little tether points. I'll put the camera on here and essentially just tether it. And I have tested it. This does not show up in the footage. It doesn't show up in the 360 footage either as well. It's so small. So it just works perfect. These little carabiners are awesome, super strong, and they also have a locking mechanism where you can actually lock it so it prevents it from opening up. So I've got this on three locations in the bike. I've mounted one here, I've mounted one down here as well, and I've mounted one here on the right side too, if you noticed. Um, now, one other uh, recent upgrade that I did here is the uh, shift shaft supporter. The shift shaft supporter, uh, as I mentioned in my video, which you can check out here up in the above link, what it does is it supports the shift shaft from uh, excessive movement, uh, which ideally results in smoother shifting. Now I've gotten several comments from you guys on this. One comment mentioned that perhaps this will essentially support the shaft such that any impact on the, the bike, say if a rock hits here or something like that, it'll actually direct the impact to the gearbox and possibly do some damage to the gearbox. I don't think that's gonna be really an issue. And the reason why is just because the tolerance 
without the supporter on this thing is so tight. I think there's just a, even less than a millimeter of free play in that, even without the supporter. Um, so I actually think that this is probably going to do more good than it will bad. Um, you know, sure, certainly if I get a, a direct impact this way, yeah, perhaps maybe, um, maybe some of that would be directed into the gearbox, but I would also say some of that impact would also get dispersed throughout this, this supporter as well too. The other thing too is that it does add support. So if I were to get a side impact, it would, it would definitely help support that shift shaft from getting uh, a ton of damage. Um, so I think I'm gonna keep this thing on. I haven't had any issues uh, in the last week, uh, you know, since I've been riding the bike. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and keep that on and just roll with it, see how it goes, even though it doesn't really do much in terms of shift smoothness. Um, just maybe a peace of mind. It's a nice piece of equipment. I did uh, create a mount here for the Garmin InReach Mini so I can get some navigation if my phone goes kaput. Oh yes, sorry, uh, actually one other upgrade. So I did actually purchase uh, this little piece here uh, what this does is it allows the the uh, the bike the seat to get aerated under here. Uh, it provides a little bit of cushion as well too, so this should pr uh, hopefully prevent some of the monkey butt everyone talks about. As I will be sitting on this bike for a long time. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it in terms of the upgrades and downgrades that I've done to the bike itself uh, to get this thing ready to go. Uh, if you guys notice anything, you see anything I should do, uh, then definitely let me know in the comments. Uh, if you have any questions, certainly ask those in the comments as well, too. All right, until next time, this is ADV in Japan, out.